we're headed back to the mountain. So like we, we stayed nice. at a pretty nice, uh, condo. Uh, we were just South of six. So in Edwards and, uh, the, I think it's called the Arrowhead Resort. Does that sound right? Oh, you're an Arrowhead. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful yeah. Spot. Yeah. Well, we showed South up and went, Oh, this condo was very inexpensive and we were like oh we're in the fancy neighborhood like <laughs> everything is relative arrowhead you got to go through the gate yeah and that's like so of course i hadn't peed since like lyman and so like pushed all the way in and, and i get off six and i'm like all right we're going right to the building i'll get in and then i see the gatehouse and i was like what are the procedures to get through the gatehouse i have to go to the bathroom wait what state was this in colorado oh that's what i thought it keeps bringing up oklahoma that's so weird. Edwards? Uh, Arrowhead Resort, Colorado. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's – put it put in uh, Arrowhead Resort, Edwards, Colorado. Yeah, Arrowhead is – it's it started out as a small, private, uh, very, very private, very exclusive uh, kind of home division. And then about 10, 15 years ago, it merged with Beaver Creek Resort. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, part of Beaver Creek. That's yeah, so, why. So it's they have a, a Beaver Creek, yeah. Ross, they have a lift like at the back of the property that like takes mm. you up over the hill into Beaver Creek, basically. Gotcha. Yeah, they, Arrowhead started with this. They had their own tiny little ski resort, and it was like supposed to be the you know, the super exclusive posh spot, right? Like right outside of Vale, private ski resort, private golf, really exclusive community. And they realized quickly that it just wasn't sustainable. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we got into the 2000s, especially beyond the, the heyday of skiing in the 80s. And it just wasn't sustainable to have their own little resort. And they, they had a good deal to merge with Beaver Creek and create Bachelors Gulch, which is a whole nother very mm -hmm. high end, very intermediate ski area um, with lots of, lots of acreage that connects the two resorts together. And it, it was a big marketing thing for them, the, the whole village to village skiing, similar to what you get in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I, I rarely ever go over to Arrowhead anymore unless I'm skiing with you know friends or family or something like that. It's right. it's a good spot to bring that solid intermediate. Gotcha. I mean, intermediate for you guys, everything's relative. Out here, this would be like fucking black diamonds. So <laughs> Ross is yeah, in Arrowhead's cool. It's all it's all <laughs> greens and blues. Yeah, that's unlike anything we have out here. Short of like going way, way, way up north into like New Hampshire or Vermont. Well, it seems, right. it seems like it'd be a good spot to take. So I have four kids. Uh, my oldest is 12. My youngest is two to go back there in the winter, let them ski on those hills, especially if they're going to be a little mm -hmm. less populated. Like some of the, yeah. I mean, this, See that? who knows what this season's going to look like at all, but. Absolutely. I was talking to a good buddy of mine. Um, he owns a restaurant um, at the base of Beaver Creek. Um, nice. One of the privately owned restaurants. It's not a Vail Resorts entity. Um, and we're just kind of discussing, you know, what does it look like if, if there's not a ski season or what does it look like if they're limited to the numbers that they can put on chairlifts and what, like, what is this going to look like? And one mm -hmm. thing that we kind of landed on was Vail and Beaver Creek are not going anywhere. Tiny, yeah. <laughs> small resorts scattered around the country may find bankruptcies really quickly. In yeah. fact, Vail Resorts is likely mm -hmm. to be the one who buys them up. Right. Um, but just Vail and Beaver Creek... You know, Vail, Beaver Creek, Aspen, Steamboat, Keystone, Breckenridge, these places are not going anywhere. There's enough money floating around there that somebody will float it, Reg like pretty much regardless. Yeah, and to that point, the real estate, that there's so much money in infrastructure that's already exists there and the value mm -hmm. of that infrastructure, you know, even if you see a 20% decrease in the value, you're still talking about some of the highest valued real estate in the world. Um, it's fair this is the place that everybody wants to be. So where everywhere else tanks, you know, we usually still see, uh, you know, pretty decent markets mm. um, just because this is where people want to move to. Interesting. Yeah. Ross, as you're doing your house hunts, you, oh, fuck. you don't, well, don't like, rub it in. No, no, <laughs> but like just to make yourself feel better, go look at Colorado real estate and it's well, like oh, for Jesus. me, it was cause I'm in Kansas city. So like my house, like if I just picked it up and put it in the mountains, it's like 1.4 easy. Right. Well, I'm one town away from Greenwich, so yeah, extrapolate, you're <laughs> extrapolate as you wish. It's yeah, fun. yeah, it's, yeah. For you, you could just compare. Oh. You're like, I could spend the same amount in Connecticut, or I could spend <laughs> the same amount in Colorado. Where would I rather be? Pretty much, pretty much. Uh, I mean, it, it's all good. <laughs> you know, it, 
house hunting and the real estate market is weird. I just wish, I wish I could teleport to the places that weren't here, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> because if we want to go skiing or snowboarding, we have the two closest places being Hunter Mountain in New York, which is bleh at that. Like it's not, it's not good. You can run every, every single trail in the morning. Um, and then, you know, you go any further and it's like, you're doing six hours up to Mount snow and right. that's still not spectacular. Like my, you know, my best friend just moved to Denver and he's like, Oh, I'm going to go to this place and this place. And like, I couldn't ski that many trails in a season if I wanted to. Yeah. Being in Denver, you get spoiled, especially with now with the, uh, the multi passes, whether you get the Epic pass or the icon pass, it's, it's a coin flip as to which mm-hmm. one you get. And some people alternate, you know, this year they get one next year, they'll get the other. Um, because you end up with access to like 20 different resorts all within a two and a half hour drive. Oh my God. And I would say five of those 20 resorts are among the top 10 in the world. Right. Crazy. So is that like Fucking crazy? Vail, Breck, Keystone, Copper. Yes. Yeah, so on the, on the Vail resort side, you'd have Vail, Breckenridge, Keystone. Um, they used to have a deal with Arapahoe Basin. That's kind of fizzled out. Mm-hmm. So they, you've got those on the I-70 corridor. Um, Vail Resorts also acquired Crested Butte on the Epic Pass, which is a little bit more of a hoof, but yeah, yeah. super extreme terrain down mm-hmm. there. Um, then you've got the Icon Pass. You're looking at like Steamboat and Winter Park and Copper. Um, yep. You know, again, all within that kind of two to two and a half hour drive. Yeah, Winter and, Park for us was our go-to quite a bit between Keystone and Winter Park. You no, know, there's also a Winter Park, Florida, like right outside Orlando. Oh yeah, that's where all the old <laughs> people live. Yeah, it, it's Orlando there's, Overflow. There's actually a Winter Park Club. Um, it's a Winter Park Ski Club that is based in Winter Park, Florida, and mm-hmm. they own a small space in Winter Park, Colorado. Really? Uh, right at the base of the mountain, <laughs> their little clubhouse. Uh, oh my god, they, I love that! Yeah, they they store all their gear there, and uh, <laughs> you know they they um they own a the club itself owns a couple of uh, condos right there at the base of the resort, so it's kind of like a big sh- uh, share. Um, you know the Winter Park <laughs> Ski Club, and we all laugh that the Winter Park Ski Club is based in Winter Park, Florida. That's so funny. It's pretty hilarious. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so we could probably get to the podcast yeah. which is a lot of what we just did um, much. it's not any really different um i say welcome to the show i introduce myself I, ross introduced himself you get to introduce yourself uh you're a lot easier tonight normally our guests have like longer names and they sometimes go by the short version so i'm like whatever you introduce yourself as is what you're going to be but Ryan's pretty straightforward. So. Yeah, True. yeah. Honestly, I, I go by Sphinx for the most part because okay. there's Ryan's in the class since kindergarten. Fair. Uh, as a Chris who grew up in the 80s, I completely understand. <laughs> so, yeah. At one point, I think there were four of us in one of, I think it was second or third grade. There was Chris C, Chris P, Chris T, and Chris S. Oh, my God. I feel like Chris S was the only one that wasn't a variation of a girl's name. So, because <laughs> Chrissy is yeah, Chrissy, Christy, Christy, yeah, Crispy, Crispy. I mean, all kinds of illusions for a girl named Crispy, but yeah. I don't know. Moving on. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm gonna start the show so we can start talking about fun stuff. Um, welcome to the Off the Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. And I'm Spanx. <laughs> Hi, Spanx. Uh, see, you did it again. I, it was uh, the first time in like three weeks. I had to. Ross normally talks right when I say this is our podcast about anything and everything off road. It's it's literally it's starting to become a gag. Like when he doesn't do it, I'm like, where where were you? It's like some kind of internal obligation when somebody says hi to you to say hi back, you know, <laughs> and. Especially since this is the only socializing without masks now. It's just like every time somebody says hi, I'm like, oh my God, hi. <laughs> Dude, I, I have appreciated the fact that I don't have to like fake smile at people in public anymore because I'm from the Midwest and I grew up in the Midwest and that's what yeah. you do to people in public. But I'm wearing a mask and you can't tell. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. And I'm doing the opposite. In the Northeast, it's like you, you can hide your, uh, you know, your, your general anger or disposition towards somebody so get away with murder 
Yeah, everybody seems to have to communicate with their eyes now. I like to walk through the grocery store and like make faces at people behind my mask and see if they know that I'm making a face at them or not. <laughs> I actually got recognized the other day. One of my former middle school students was like, hey, are you? I was like, how did you tell? Like, I was, like, we're different classes. Like, how would you know that? The weird part was I went, you look familiar too. I don't know. Just trying to be nice. Just like saying hi back, right? Yeah. Uh, as always on the show, we were social distancing before it was mandated with Ross in Connecticut. I'm in the Midwest and Ryan is in Colorado tonight. I don't say, I don't know why I said tonight, like tomorrow night, you're going to be somewhere else, but. I, actually, well, I'll be somewhere else, but I'll still be in Colorado. There you go. <laughs> still jealous. We're Doesn't be matter where, where, still jealous. <laughs> we're going to be a Where's Spanx tomorrow. We'll find out. Where's Spanx? <laughs> uh, jump into news you want it ross because i yeah well i mean we got over the bronco yeah the bronco hump is over so now we can talk about hemi powered wrangler so and there were spy photos show will be two weeks after the bronco show goes live okay tomorrow so we're well (laughs) over the bronco hump and now we're now we're just we're back to like something resembling reality so fca and jeep are again doing what they do best And we have large V8s in vehicles that mostly don't need large V8s. And that 392 Wrangler concept seems to be like it's to be a reality. And there were spy photos of effectively exactly the concept out and about testing. And there was some question over why it had Florida plates, not like Michigan manufacturer plates or Ohio manufacturer plates. But I think the long and the short of it is probably – if I had to guess, they're going to try to time it like right around when Bronco production starts yeah. and we'll see 392 Wranglers out and about um, for, for better or for worse. I don't, it might be scarier than Hellcats for everybody, you know, like cheap Hellcats, but time will tell. 390, like it's a lot of cubic inches in a truck that, I mean, Wranglers are appropriately heavy. They're not like massively heavy, but like I – like what, what, uh, man, what William was talking about on the show when we had him yep. on about like his JK getting a little light in the wind and mm-hmm. like, this is going to have way more power. And Oh yeah. I mean, I, I was texting with Camille today. So I, I booked a Wrangler unlimited with the two liter with ESS for a week. And Camille said he just spent a week with a diesel Wrangler and it easily cruises at, um, speeds that cannot Allegedly. be. Allegedly. allegedly cruises at 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 uh, extra legal speeds and said it's like almost unnecessarily powerful and torquey and fast as is so what happens when you add even faster yeah add like 200 horsepower um so that'll be fun if i'm if i'm really good in my editing skills right here's where i'll drop in the robbie gordon grand cherokee srt passing everything in <laughs> cannonball video robbie no robbie no <laughs> exactly <laughs> For, for editorial purposes, we will borrow his other YouTube <laughs> video. <laughs> that is a great video. He needs so, to remake that with a track hawk. It does say like, so I'm reading, I'm reading a little bit on it now because obviously he didn't have time to do that today, but like road and track has like got enough information, like 30 prototypes already exist. Like 30, 30 is what it says. Like, it sounds like we're going to production here. Good. Um, Good. Yeah. So nothing's guaranteed. There's no official announcement, but like, Dude, but it's an FCA concept vehicle. Like, they I mean, have they, all of the tooling to make it happen yesterday. Yeah, exactly. Like, based on what I saw of a Ford Transit's line when I toured it, like, power plants get assembled somewhere else, and then they just slip the vehicle on it. Yeah. So, just start getting a basket of 392s sitting <clears> here, and <throat> let's go. I'm sure that sure the transmission has to be upgraded, right? Um. Well, think of it this way. This the grand Jesus, the Wrangler has the ZF eight speed. It's the same ZF eight speed, just it? tuned and slightly. Yeah, it's a ZF. It's the eight, and um, the Grand Cherokee has that with the SRT engine. So yeah, and also go. with the Hellcat engine, the Charger and Challenger have that same transmission with the six four, the five seven, and the Hellcat engine. So. I'm sure there's going to be some kind of beefing up of things and hopefully like a Dana 60 outback to actually not like just incinerate 
axles, but I, yeah, I, the sub will mention a problem they were potentially having with like fitting it in front of the firewall, I think. And again, like it's FCA, like it have like car, it out. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> have, have car will fit giant fucking engine in it. Yeah. If they've already got 30 prototypes, I'm sure they figured it out. Of course it's, it's in here on KO twos. <clears throat> like yeah. they I, I feel like if Jeep had a sense of humor, they'd strap Goodyear Wranglers on everything right now. Right after the <laughs> after the Broncos are going with just their good, good years. year, good years, yeah. <laughs> the good year, good years. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the. I think that's the only news that we've had in the off road world since since Bronco. What's your What's your uh, rattle about? Oh God! So so the Miata had a rattle, um, which started as a rattle and turned into a knock. And the knock turned into what sounded like a marble rolling back and forth every time I move the car. Okay. So, so you move, you know, you turn right and it rolls left and you turn left and it rolls right and you stop and it sounds like it goes forward. So we thought it was a glove box. So I, I pulled everything out of the glove box. It didn't change it. So that eliminated, you know, the possibility of there being so something in the glove like box. sounds like you like, it's up in front. Like it's it sounded like it was in the dashboard. It sounded like right. it was like directly in front of where the glove box is. So I took everything out of the glove box didn't work. So then I took the glove box itself out. The whole like actual physical unit took that out. Didn't do it. So I went on the Miata forum, Googled, everybody's going, okay, there's this bolt against the heater. You have to tighten the bolt down. The bolt that I tightened down was loose, exactly as they said. And I did that. And I was like, so thrilled. You know, I did it before work at like 7.15 in the morning. Like thrilled. I, I figured this out, blah, blah, blah. Put the car in reverse, move one inch, and it makes the same noise. And I was <laughs> like, uh, it was driving me fucking crazy. So I went back on the forum and they said, uh, and then I searched like a different search phrase. And it led me to a bolt in the, uh, like the, the frame of the windshield in the seal portion where the convertible part closes against the windshield frame loosens up. And it's like a hex bolt that loosens up and gets caught on this little like catch that serves as a trim panel and it just rolls around back and forth. So during lunch, I think yesterday I brought the car in and of course the car was sitting outside and it was like 97 degrees outside all day. And I'm like, sweating just doing anything and i take you know like all the trim off rip the thing down and there's a bolt sitting right there just completely (laughs) loose and um i was sweaty enough and frustrated enough that i didn't bother to try and find where it came from so yeah the uh the car is one bolt lighter and one rattle better (laughs) which is nice and i'm not going fucking crazy anymore so you, you simplified and added lightness. You literally <laughs> took something yeah. off it. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and it's not, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's an upgrade in that I'm no longer joking about driving the car into a lake or off cliff. So <laughs> as far as far as upgrades go, that's pretty good. And that, that's all the news that I have about my cars in my life. <laughs> I completely understand. Uh, uh, you have much bigger news. Yep. Yeah, so yeah, I have, uh, I have a 1994 Toyota Land Cruiser that um, my uncle bought it new. It's been in the family since 94. Um, and I have decided to move on from it. Um, so I finally listed it. Uh, I think last, last two weeks ago is when I listed it first. Um, I waited a week and I dropped the price a little. Um, and I've had one guy contact me or one, one lady contact me. I met her and her Toyota friend, which I, I assume that's, I, that's the only way I know how to describe him. He showed up in a, in a similar vintage forerunner. We took mine for a spin and they said, Hey, we're going to go look at another one tomorrow. We'll let you know. Never and that. well, Sunday, I, this was Friday night, Sunday. I was like, you know what? I'll just send her another message. Be like, Hey, did you, did you get the other one? Like fine. If you did, like, I just don't want to, just want to know kind of thing. And she was like, the other seller never sent us an address. We've mm-hmm. never looked at that one yet. And she she goes, I'm still mulling it over. <laughs> okay. Weird. First first person who shows up with five, six grand is yours. Like just just let me know. 
three hundred nine thousand miles. It's good quality. Still got a lot of life left. Yeah. But I have driven it a couple. Like I drove it to the test drive, and I drove it to work the other day, and uh, I don't think I'm gonna miss it. Isn't it weird how like, you get to a point with a project and you're like, you know what? It's got to go. And then you list it and a week later you're like, I, I need it gone. I can't let it sit just well, like in purgatory. The, the, the only stumbling blocks or hurdles for me with like finally moving on from it was like my uncle and my cousin spent a lot of time in this truck too. I offered it back to them. And mm -hmm. both of the, my uncle went, I don't have room for anything. And I, like he's got plenty of land. He has room if he wants to make room. He doesn't, uh, want, he doesn't want it on his, on, right. his, uh, on his head. And I think my cousin just put in a, a bid on a hundred year old house in Seattle. And I was like, I sent him a text. I was like, pretty sure those don't come with two car garages, do they? And he was like, well, no, <laughs> it does not. <laughs> so I was like, well, so you're, you're probably also a no. And he's like, well, well hold on a sec. So I'm kind of stuck in limbo land because he hasn't responded yet but mm -hmm. i have it listed just in case so if i get a decent offer i'll probably call him and be like hey i got an offer like right yes or no well uh, if my uh, my house thing goes to total shit maybe i'll i'll buy it i don't know <laughs> dude the land cruiser has ac the forerunner doesn't <laughs> <laughs> you know i have an emotional connection to forerunners i know you do uh this makes i also have a fourth gen v8 forerunner <laughs> So, and the reason the Land Cruiser needs to go is I bought an 08 Sequoia that does everything other than right, yep. having a solid front axle, which we went over on the last show too. So, yeah. So, so that's my, my update. So any, any listeners would like to own a piece of the podcast lore? <laughs> <laughs> Send me the, uh, I hate mud lake. I'll share it around my little circles. I will. Uh, I list, I tried to list like, you know, how you're a decent seller and you list every little thing you've done to the truck. Mm -hmm. My, my list kept getting longer and longer and longer. And I was like, Oh my gosh. Like, and then I forgot to put like, Hey, I have KO twos on it. Oh, I fixed the tail light. Also, I spent a thousand dollars on tires. By the right. Way. That's li literally, yeah. I think in the listing, it says replace tail light wiring harness underneath KO twos with approximately 20,000 miles off. <laughs> But one of those was a project and one of them was going to somebody and having tires installed. So. Yeah. Like the, the tires are an app. Like to be honest, since they've been on, like I haven't had to think about tires ever because they do what they're mm -hmm. supposed to do. So let's, let's move on. Moving on. Uh, Spinks, I do have a note that says you're our first professional athlete. So we've never, we've never had one of those on the podcast before. Oh boy. That's, <laughs> that's a little bit of a stretch at this point. I've, I've been retired as an athlete for some years now. But Once you're got, a pro, you can always claim to be a pro. If you paid to do something, that still translates. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I, I got paid to slide down a hill on snow. And, uh, That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that is awesome. <laughs> no doubt about it. It is really awesome. Yeah. It is really awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I grew up out here in Colorado, so that's that's kind of what we did, right? You know, we play in the mountains. You know, that mm -hmm. that that was daycare as a kid. You know, go outside and you know, get yourself dirty, go roll down the hill. Right. Um, you know, in the summertime, we were rolling down hills on bikes. And in the wintertime, we're sliding down hills on the snow on skis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So not, not too bad. Sounds, sounds like good a good gig. deal. Yeah. Thanks, mom and dad. Did you get to travel with it <laughs> at all? I, I did. I, I actually got to travel all over the world, which is really cool. Um, yeah, you guys were, were talking about having to, to drive really far up to Mount Snow before to go skiing. Mm -hmm. I was actually an alternate at X Games 4 at Mount Snow. Really? <laughs> oh, uh, shit. It, it, it was the that first was really time funny. I'd ever been out to the East Coast, and I was just like, I don't understand how you guys ski on this. I can see my reflection. <laughs> oh, it's not skiing. It's sliding. It's, 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 it's sliding. It's, and it's really hard. I, I, yeah, it, man, it's ice. It's usually ice. <laughs> yeah, you, you do everything you can not to crash, of course. But I, I just remember in that contest, like the last thing I want to do is put a hip down on this ice because I might not get back up again. Mm -hmm. you know, Colorado Sliding. snow is nice and dry and fluffy, and you know it, it's relatively soft when you when you land in it. My uh, my, it was soft enough for me to snap a collarbone once. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's painful. <laughs> it's not, not, not that difficult to do. It's a real no. painful injury and not that hard to do. 
It was one one bump and I just landed wrong. <laughs> yep. Yeah, my brother did a collarbone a, a few years back. It was it was pretty gnarly. The best was uh so I was like a I think it was my senior year of high school and uh it was over like it was during high school basketball season still and I remember had one having one of the basketball players like come up behind me. I was already fairly tall, like six two, six three in high school and he he was much taller than me and put his hands on my shoulders and I just remember crumpling to the floor. Because <laughs> there's nothing oh. There's no visual on you when you break your collarbone. Like you wear a brace under your shirt kind of thing to right, hold it back right, and in right. place. So he just slammed his giant paw down on my shoulder. I just crumpled. Oh, oh. oh. well, yeah, I'm eternally jealous of the, of the skiing you guys have out West. Well, my, Sounds like you've done a good job of making use of it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, when gr growing up, you know, like I said, skiing was kind of my passion it's really what i wanted to do and, and mountain biking was in there as well it's just kind of like i said what we did in the summer that was just like skiing um and then right you know right out of high school heading into college i actually signed my first pro contract um which at that point you know as a at that age was really a dream come true and x game stuff was just kind of starting to rise up um whole extreme sports thing was was changing from being kind of like a a thing that was a few people did and exiled a punk kind of kid thing from like the skateboarding and the surfing kind of mentality. And, you know, even along those lines, as you had skateboarding and surfing coming into mainstream, you have guys like Tony Hawk that were starting to be mainstream celebrity. Mm -hmm. People were starting to look at those extreme sports and thinking like, this is actually legitimate. Uh, um, yeah. It took a long time for people to realize that the athleticism behind it isn't just like, you know, having the mentality to be able to do it. Absolutely. And also the, the, like you said, the techniques, the perseverance of the uh, developing those techniques and the risk factor that was there, you know, there's a lot of things that were, you know, definitely weird for some people to comprehend. Um, and those same things were really what was appealing to a lot of us out there, you know, the, the risk factor mm -hmm. and speed and, and, really the evolution and the fact that we could continue to do something new. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. That, that was what I think was the most exciting. Um, you know, and I, I had retired from competitive skiing in 2008. Um, and I felt like I kind of got to pass the torch onto that next generation that carried free skiing and snowboarding right on into the Olympics. Um, and then you have athletes like Sean White, who you know, really yeah. took it from, you know, something that was done in these, little holes in the wall in the country or around the world in these little mountain towns and blew it up to a true mainstream and, and mm -hmm. a respected sport, you know, not just a, a thing that a couple of punk teenagers were doing out. out right. <laughs> um, you know, so it was, it was really cool to be a part of that evolution. Um, you know, and then take, take all the things that I learned from that, from basically traveling and running around in the outdoors and, you know, the, that whole outdoor lifestyle fitness. And then that also worked into stuff like photography and media production and uh, working with brands, developing products. Mm. Um, you know, we're, we wanted to ski backwards and they didn't make skis that you could ski backwards on. So we were taking torches to the back of our mogul skis and bending them up so God. that we could create a little tip on the back of it, you know. Doing and then, just flip over. Oh yeah. And, and, you know, the, the ski, after we bent the tip up, it would work for about a month, a month and a half or so. And then the whole thing would just fall apart. <laughs> you know, so the evolution of the products and being able to work with some of these ski brands to create not only just skis with twin tips, but skis that were actually designed to do the things that we wanted to do to progress the sport in the way that we were progressing it. Um, that was different than your traditional mogul ski or your traditional racing ski. Um, so it was a really cool experience for me to not only play around in the mountains as a job, um, but get to see how products are developed and how we evolve things. Um, you know, you guys see that in the off-road world a lot, right? You go out and something breaks and you come back and somebody oh, yeah. says, I'm, I, I'm making control arms for this thing that are actually going to stand up to, you know, driving this trail. Um, and then somebody builds, you know, wheels that are going to do it. And then somebody builds, you know, on and on and on, right? Um, so it's a, it's a kind of a parallel that what we're doing in the ski and the bike world, you know, is evolving these products to do what we want to do and mm -hmm. to be able to go where we want to go. 
So transitioning to the bike world, when, when I was out in Edwards, I, I don't think I understood how much e-bikes have kind of taken over. Um, I, I felt like every time I looked up, even like small ones with kids on them, they, they oh, yeah. seemed like they were everywhere. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you think about it out here in the mountains, right? Riding a bike is something that a lot of us do. But out here in the mountains, the hills are steep, right? Yeah. Like oh, yeah. mountains, right? They're oh, not yeah. really, you know, you go and you ask a lot of people that live here and you say, hey, would you ride your bike to work every day? Mm -hmm. or would you ride your bike to the bar in the afternoon? Or would you ride your bike down to the park to the concert? And the answer is absolutely, except for that one <laughs> hill back to my house. Said or that right. one except, <laughs> it's always except. It's always that one spot, that one steep hill or that one gnarly section that you just don't want to ride in the dark or you don't want to ride after you've been out all day or you don't mm -hmm. want to try to ride after working because it's just like, I just don't want to do it. You add the e-bike element, the motor and everything, and now that excuse is gone. You know, right. that super difficult steep hill, that really long section, um, or maybe that really rough section is just now a fun, enjoyable ride. And right. you're actually enjoying that section as opposed to, you know, basically dreading it. So, as, and then, and this is just lack of knowledge on how an e-bike works. So obviously there's a battery, obviously there's an electric motor. I'm assuming pedaling helps charge the battery. Man, I wish we could fit all that stuff into a bike, right? <laughs> the truck of a Prius, you can fit all sorts of stuff to do that recharging. You know, Formula One drivers yeah. actually generate enough heat out of the braking and stuff like that where they can generate energy that, that is useful. Yeah. Unfortunately, in a bicycle, it's just not practical at this point in time okay. to, to do recharging. Now, the way that e-bikes are built, typically you have a pedal assist function which okay, means right. you start pedaling like a normal bike and the motor kicks in and provides assistance along with you. And that assistance can range based on what power level you've selected. And also right. of course, on what type of motor that particular e-bike is equipped with. Okay. Your standard, we call them European style e-bikes because they're typically manufactured for the European market. Mm -hmm. They have a 250 nominal watt limit. So, 250 nominal watts is about the equivalent of a quarter of a horsepower, you know, maybe yeah. a horsepower or so. Um, and it's also about the equivalent of what a normal person can put out as a maximum effort. Okay. So, so that's how much assist you're getting like per assist. revolution. Okay. Right. So measured, measured output, you plus the 250 watt nominal motor, you're probably putting 250 to 300 watts down, you know, on an average. Mm -hmm. That's about the equivalent to an elite level cyclist. Okay. Which, which is pretty good. Like I said, that helps you overcome a lot of the, the mm -hmm. you know, small obstacles, the hills that a lot of us are just not fit enough or, or <laughs> able enough to get up and over or up here at altitude, you know, it's just not going to happen. Right. Uh, it definitely wasn't happening for me. And I was just hiking. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and then, you know, the, the motor can also go all the way up here in the United States. We actually have a, a limit of 750 Watts, um, 750 Watts or lower. And it can be classified as an electric bicycle and does mm -hmm. not cross over into any motorcycle type of categories. That's uh, what I was going to say. It sounds by, understanding and this is not the electric bicycle thing but the electric mountain bike seems to me for most people like it splits the difference between a dedicated standard mountain bike and a dirt bike which is like a happy medium yeah absolutely and there's there's all sorts of mediums in between the two based on kind of where you want to go and what you want to do with it mm -hmm. so if you're going to run dirt bike trails, there's plenty of electric motorcycles out there that don't have any pedal assist. Or if they do have pedals, they have a power rating of like 3000 Watts. Mm. That's obviously far beyond bicycle power. Now you're into being an electric motorcycle. You're riding on right. motorcycle trails. You're staying away from bike. The advantage of being in the classified electric bicycle 
is as our regulations for trail centers and different trails start to evolve more and more, and they have evolved really well on the federal level, the electric bicycle is much more treated as a bicycle than a motorcycle. So it gives you access to trails that are specifically non-motorized. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the big advantages you get as an off-road explorer is where you can no longer legally or physically drive your, your truck, mm -hmm. you can hop on the e-bike and keep on going. <laughs> it's like you're, it's a, it's a campsite extender. Yeah. It's a campsite extender. It's an adventure extender. Hiking uh, trail extender. Yeah, and you know, I think that there's a whole sorts of uses for it that that you can kind of get into. You know, as as a photography enthusiast, I love being able to hop on the bike from the campsite, and you know, especially doing night photography and stuff. Mm -hmm. I can ride up a trail, or you know, gain a little bit more of a vantage point, or maybe I've just got the tent all set up and everything, and you know, my truck's not moving because my daughter's mm -hmm. up in there watching the iPad. So I can <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I can jump on the uh, the e bike and take off and get right. out on a little adventure of my own. Dude, I completely understand that one. <laughs> it just, that makes sense. So the um, the image I liked the most was it looked like you guys had a trailer set up for it. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, so to give you a, just a quick little history of of who we are at Quiet Cat, um, we've been making electric bicycles for a number of years. And the company started in really the hunting world. Okay. Um, basically, the, our owners have a hunting lodge in Illinois. Big, big white-tailed deer hunters. Okay. That and makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it, yeah. It they found that the e-bike was an excellent tool for quietly getting into different tree stands, uh, getting further out, um, getting to places where it was a whole lot less populated, getting to places that had less pressure on the animals. Uh, mm -hmm. So the e-bike made a lot of sense. Uh, so the trailers, you know, became a real natural accessory for being able to haul all of your gear with you, you know, especially right. elk hunting out here in the West, you want to throw some tents and some sleeping bags and, and all the rest of the gear you need. Mm -hmm. You throw that stuff in the trailer. That way you can head in five, 10, 15 miles away from where you can physically park your truck. And also if you snag something out in the woods, you can throw it on the trailer and, bring it back absolutely we've we've had guys be able to haul back you know white-tailed deer no problem and then you know with the bigger animals like the elk antelope or moose um <laughs> you know anybody that's that's a big game hunter will tell you that the the best part about it is the hunt the worst part about it is packing that meat back out yes oh, I bet. And, you know even even just being able to take quarters and, and pieces um you know, and, and roll them along with the bike and the trailer is just so much mm -hmm. more efficient. Yeah. Um, and in a lot of ways, it can help be more efficient and more conservative because you're less likely to have spoiled meat and, you know, all sorts of other things. Um, so so that, that kind of evolved from the hunting into more kind of general overlanding. Okay. Uh, I came on board with the company about two and a half years ago now, and I am actually not a hunter. Um, <laughs> Basically, what? a kid who grew up hunting. in Vail. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it, it was. It, it's always been around. I've got plenty of yeah. friends that do it. You know, I just was so busy riding bikes and sliding down on skis um, that it was just never something I really got into. Um, no, I, I get it. As a kid who grew up in the Midwest, where guns are everywhere, like I know how to shoot. I learned to shoot. I could shoot black powder yeah. rifles, but like we just never went and shot animals with them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I got I got to learn a lot of that stuff, and you know, growing up with with friends that had everything, I felt like we had summer camp just from going to friends' houses, you know, shooting <laughs> targets, and mm -hmm. you, know, you know, dad says, yeah, you guys can go shoot, but you got to go pack the rounds first. Yep. You know, and in there packing twenty two rounds so that we can go. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's less fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it it it, it was when the fun it, becomes work, it's not fun. Yeah, it, it was a good experience though of understanding you know, how that stuff all works. Yep. Um, but so, you know, with Quiet Cat, when I came on, you know, I came on with this big kind of overland adventure, you know, outdoor lifestyle. Um, mm -hmm. and, and also I've been mountain bike racing for a number of years. So I had, you know, a little bit of that inspiration as well. And so I, I kind of looked at everything and thought, you know, when I go out exploring with the family or when I go out, you know, mm -hmm. 
trying to see where this or that road goes or if this mining road is still open or if that logging road is still accessible to get up to this or that place. You know, everything that I'm doing out there short of harvesting an animal is the exact same as these guys were doing with these, especially right. these robots. Um, so it was a real natural transition um, to kind of roll into that more overlanding and, and extend beyond just that hunting scene and, mm -hmm. and reach that broader audience. Um, Makes sense. Where, where we kind of attracted Jeep, um, you know, and they, they kind of found us and said, you know, you guys look like you're really aligned with what we're doing, um, which made for a really, really cool partnership. Mm -hmm. Like an extension of the brand almost. Yeah. Um, and, and just a, a, a real alignment of, of both the brands together. Mm. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean the hunting side of things, I never, that it never crossed my mind that the two would be related, but I mean, just from time spent on forums and time spent off roading, I've seen countless Jeeps with bikes, you know, on like on the, not necessarily on the trails, but in campsites at the trails with a bike rack on the back and they're going to off road one day, run trails on, in the truck one day. Then the next day they're going to pull the bike out and go mountain biking. So it's one plus one equals two here. Absolutely. And I, I think as we look at the different family adventures now um, as well, you know, I have no problem sitting behind the driver's seat for eight hours a day at seven and a half miles an hour in low range. You know, my wife, on the other hand, would like to maybe get out and feel the wind through her hair. You know, my daughter would definitely Touché. like to go out and paddle around the lake. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, th I think especially with our new normal as we move forward here, I think we're going to see a lot of the activities are all packed into the truck and uh, you head out into the back country. And, you know, like you said, we're going to post up and we'll do some wheel to get up here. Maybe we'll have a trail day one day, mm -hmm. uh, you know, another day on the bikes you know, or, or a combination of, you know, of everything where some people are doing some things and others are doing other things. Makes so, sense. Especially with the, like I said, with the whole family aspect now where, you know, it's not necessarily packing in with a whole bunch of friends and going out and doing a big group outing. Um, you know, we're not out doing jamborees and, uh, and big adventures with big groups. It's more right. a small group of the family <laughs> trying to appeal to everybody. Mm -hmm. So then are, are, this may be taboo, but are you a Jeep guy or do you have your own, uh, <laughs> your own MO? So it's, it's, it's kind of funny. I think you guys, especially, uh, and I'm sure your audience will get a good kick out of this. I have been a Toyota guy forever. I have, I actually have two forerunners. I have a third gen. Nice. nice. Um, awesome. My Hell first yeah. car, yeah. My first car <laughs> ever was an 84, uh, forerunner. I was born in 84. Damn. Okay. Uh, so that was, it was kind of a dream car for me. I was like, I want the 84. I want that, that fuel injected motor that still has a rigid front axle. So I, I drove that thing into the ground for about 16 months when I was 16 years old. Oh, those um, those and then, uh, so yeah, cool. I, I bought a first second, year, man. Crazy. Right. I, I bought a second gen in college and, uh, um, yeah, and then dumped that sucker when I moved to India for nine months. That's another story. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, Holy shit. Yeah, that was a good time. Is that a religious? And then, yeah, uh... I, out of left field there. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, when I came, uh, when I came back, I immediately went and found another third gen, picked that sucker up. Okay. Um, yeah. And then my, my dream car was a, uh, was a fourth gen back in, you know, when they were still in their heyday. Mm -hmm. um, so I was able to pick up an O3 limited with the V8 and the nice. In the whole nine yards, and uh, I've been driving that thing for about the last ten years. Is holy shit! It, it's pretty much my daily, and then it's with all the creature comforts. I'll throw the uh, rooftop tent on top of that sucker to, to take down for mountain bike races and whatnot when I'm mm -hmm. camping. Wow! Uh, then we'll swap the we'll swap the tent and put it <laughs> on the third gen when we want to go out in the back country and go romping. What uh? Um, what tent are you using? I, I actually have a Bear Paw Expedition. Um, Ooh, that's a good one. A Not Paws even familiar with that one. Right? Bear Paw is a small company out of Grand Junction or Palisade, Colorado. Um, and uh, really, really cool guys. They do a lot of these custom off-road trailers. Okay. Um, okay. And their, their whole theory is overbuilt, not overpriced. 
Okay. Um, and they build these really, really cool bits and they do all sorts of custom work and he'll sit there and talk your ear off and figure out exactly what you like to do and what you want to do and build you something mm -hmm. really cool. They That's a nice tent. That's a big tent. Yeah, I, I went with the big one because I, uh, I, I like having the space, um, especially mm -hmm. when it's my wife and my daughter and I all packing in together. Um, and then, you know, on the occasions when I go mountain bike racing, if I got a buddy with me, it allows us to have some space in between us. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. But each one of us can access the ladder to take a piss, if not wake up the other one. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they have a sister company, which does camper trailers, Ross. Oh God, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> and the name of that company is? Bear Paw Campers. <laughs> Creative. <laughs> They knew what they were doing. Yeah, right. Um, nice units, though. Yeah, it's, it's it's super cool. What I like about it is, you know, we oh, all know that oh, the this top is are pretty much all the same function, right? Like they're they're one of they're one of four form factors. Yeah. Um, so it was important to get one that had the proper zippers, and that had the right ripstop material, had the right type of rain fly, had the right type of steel pieces where they needed to be steel, aluminum mm -hmm. where it needed to be aluminum. Um, and yeah, it's it's been great. Oh, between the uh, between the rooftop tent and, yeah, between the rooftop tent and the quiet cat on the back of my truck, I get a lot of eyeballs. Yeah, I'm Seriously. sure you do. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, people know I'm going out fun. I I I feel like well, at least driving around Edwards and we went over to um, Glenwood Springs for a little bit. We went down to oh crap, I'm going to get the name wrong. Rifle Rifle Falls. Rifle, yeah. Yep, we went down to Rifle Falls and, and hiked around down there. But like, I felt like everywhere I looked was somebody who either had it was it was either a, a forerunner, a Wrangler, uh, the rare occasion, an actual two hundred series Land Cruiser, uh, or a hundred series. Like there was Ross. I didn't say this. I definitely passed a right hand drive diesel Land Cruiser trying oh. to like plow its oh, yeah. way up the hill out of Denver. Desperately trying. Dude, there was so much black smoke coming out of this thing. Oh, <laughs> poor saw, diesel. I saw the pump High elevation, probably not. I, I, I was going to say that the high elevation plus the uh, carburetors usually makes for some black smoke and not a lot. Uh, yeah, so he was de definitely all the way over in the right lane, definitely knew what he was doing. Like he's, He knew he wasn't going to get anywhere quick, but of course, like the 5.7 in the Sequoia was like, what? It, there's a hill in front of us? Like it just... <laughs> <laughs> just motored up like no big deal so i kind of felt bad as i went by but at the same time i was like that thing's way cooler than mine so oh. <laughs> there there is definitely a cool factor a, yeah but like you said between here you know where we're at we're right between vale and aspen so we're we're in the high country and there's a lot of people that like their toys out here yeah they do <laughs> so you know, you'll find you'll find fully restored old land cruisers uh, my wife's boss actually has listed right now a uh a Land Rover, um, I think it's the um, old 40 series. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, nice. Beautiful, beautiful, fully restored. Um, and then, like you said, it, especially around here, that's just part of the lifestyle on the weekends. You know, mm -hmm. whatever your weekend is, you drive somewhere and sleep in your tent. My my favorite part of staying in the in the resort, like the it had a an underground garage that we had access to. Nice. So I just pulled the square in, no big deal. But like everything in there had a bike rack on the mm -hmm. back of it didn't always have bikes but it had the bike rack. <laughs> that's outdoors life <laughs> yeah Which yeah bike me... racks pretty much mandatory with a colorado plate right i in assume the they just hand them out at the same time like here's your plate here's your rack like or just well, to pick up whether it's summer or winter bed. yeah it's either a bike rack or your ski rack yep which i i had a couple of run-ins trying to get a cargo carrier for the sequoia where both of them were damaged in shipping I felt like I would have blended. Yeah. I would have blended in better if I had the actual cargo carrier on top. Get out there. <laughs> yeah, you got to be careful with that one on the Sequoia because you don't get into a lot of parking garages after that. You're right. Well, Seriously. As I was like looking at where we were and and I was doing math on, I was like, yeah, if I had the cargo carrier on top, I'm not in here. Like, I don't know, I don't know where I would have parked. Dude, I guess that, it was like a public lot, like two blocks over. All the houses we've been looking at, you know, I just have the Miata right now. But every time, like we look at a house and it has a garage, Sam looks at me and she's like, you know, it. whatever you buy next won't fit. I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> well, you need to find one that has three cars, three car garage. I need to triple my budget for that. I understand. It's your first no. house first, your second and third house. 
oh god no not here <laughs> not here um so yeah. <laughs> with with the the dueling forerunners right I, i'm assuming you, you're in america's playground basically like moab's five hours away yep yep oh, see i did good math <laughs> yeah yeah so uh, have you biked what trails have you biked out there so Moab is famous for pretty much three different sections. Um, the first one that I, that's probably my favorite would be the Porcupine Rim Trail, um, which is part of another system called the Whole Enchilada. Mm -hmm. If you do the Whole Enchilada, <laughs> you're looking at basically, people measure this differently, but based on where you start, between 25 and 30 miles of single track out in the desert, probably 85% of it's downhill. And for a good solid three or four miles, you're riding literally feet away from about a 600 foot drop. That's down fun. Into Castle Valley. Oh man. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, really, it's, it's a bucket list mountain bike trail for anybody that, that rides mountain bikes. You just um, got you, 34 you miles? Up, yeah, and anywhere from 25 to 30 miles, kind of based on where you start, <laughs> uh, what time of year kind of dictates how high in elevation you can get to and then yeah where to climb up there i'm more concerned with the 600 foot drop immediately to your whichever side well the the crazy part is there's a couple sections where if you have enough speed you come in and you hit a jump and you land the jump and make a turn and it's real casual and you don't even really think about it but if you don't make the turn you're heading right over the drop no thank you it's only a few feet away <laughs> It, it's kind of weird. You, you you almost don't even realize that the drop is there until you you know pull over at some of the viewpoints and really look. And is it like banked? Is do you have like some kind of indicator, or it's just casual turn and you know huge it's, consequence? No, you, you you can see it. And there's there's also a bunch of bushes around there and stuff. So it's it's they've done a good job building the trail. So even somebody who's never been there before is you know very rarely going to just mm -hmm. hit themselves off a cliff. So uh, I. I did a little research since you were suggesting it. It says, so I'm on MB, mbtproject.com yep. or M, MTB. Whew. Yep. Yeah, that's Letter, a good one. You need to get letters, right? <laughs> Average grade on it's 5%, but there's a max grade at 37%. It's 21 degrees. And you guys both froze. <laughs> oh, stupid internet. And this will be the part of the show. On a mountain bike, out. you can actually descend things. They're so much steeper than you could ever mm -hmm. do in a in a vehicle, and you can you know you can hop off of ledges that you can't exactly right. hop off of in, right. a, in a vehicle. Human yeah. maneuverability and vehicle like they're not the same. Yeah, yeah, so um, it, yeah. That that's a super fun trail, and then you know you've got the whole Slick Rock area, which of course you know really parallels with the off road trail. Yep. There's there's quite a few sections where we'll kind of weave in and out between the off roaders, and mm -hmm. yeah, you, know, you kind of get into a rhythm where you'll start seeing the same groups over and over again, at different intersections. Oh, that's pretty funny. Yeah, it, it gets pretty good, and then you you know a lot of times if you're on similar pace, you'll end up at viewpoints about the same time. Mm -hmm. um, which, which is kind of fun. You could, you know, families could actually, if they really planned it right, could basically ride the trail together. Okay. So, okay. And just meet at different points. Yeah. Just kind of meet at different waypoints, different places where the, the off-road um, and OHV lanes kind of intersect with the marked, you know, bicycle areas. That's yeah, pretty they, wild. They try to keep it obviously as safe as possible so that when the trucks are romping around, they're not worried about running into a bike. I've done yeah. that. It's terrifying. Yeah, no, nobody wants to, you're, you're worried about breaking axles and the last thing you want to worry about is breaking somebody's bike you yeah. know, or breaking them off on a bike. Or the person riding it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want any casualties. No, <laughs> let's, let's not have that liability. Is, is Slick Rock, is that close to Arches National Park? It's, I mean. Relatively well, close. Relative. Our, our arches is a kind of on the north end of town. Okay. And so you could say it's on like the northwest end of town. And then Slick Rock is down on the southwest end of town. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they're separated by probably 10 or 15 miles. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's spots where they're, they intersect a little bit closer. But mm -hmm. our arches, for the most part, stays north and they call it east of the Colorado River. Um, okay. And the Slick Rock area is going to be down south of the Colorado River. 
really, really beautiful area. You know, definitely bucket list places to go out, you know, wheeling, you mm -hmm. know, no matter what your interest is, whether you're, you know, overlanding and just want to find a cool campsite, you know, all the way out to yep. full on rock crawling. So we, we, <laughs> Chris we, and have, I. <laughs> we, we have someone, a previous guest on the show who is doing maybe the most hilarious thing ever. She has bought into part ownership of a Suzuki XL7. Okay. And they are, she just posted pictures of it today, actually. All right. And uh, she, they are going to base, <laughs> they're going to base this vehicle in Moab. So they can basically like show up and then go take this Suzuki out into the hills where it's, they're in it for like two grand. Like they're not in it for anything. Nice. It's uh, inconsequential. Yeah. Like it's, it's, there's enough of them involved in it that it's almost like throwaway money at this point. Like, cause each, I think yep. there's like three or four of them that have bought into having this vehicle stationed out here. Mm -hmm. So when she posted pictures of it, I of course was like, well, I guess we'll just have to record the next show in Moab now. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> the follow up being that Chris and I both had trips out there canceled this year. Yeah. We so, both got crushed by independent both pandemic. cancellations. So Ross had yeah. talked Toyota into loaning him a forerunner. Yeah, and I was supposed to have a TRD Pro and pulled the plug like two and a half weeks before. Well, I, I was supposed to go hang out for Easter Jeep Safari with yeah. BF Goodrich. Which... Yeah, I was, I was actually supposed to be down there as well for that event. We were going to do a, an unveiling of the Jeep bike originally there. Uh, we, we could have met sooner is what you're saying. You probably would have met <laughs> sooner is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd have been standing there next to this thing and uh, you'd probably been like, wait, what is that? No, as as a media person, I'd be like, I get to use this now, right? Like that's just <laughs> everybody's in, everybody Free in the media all. is entitled to. <laughs> well, the the plan the plan was to bring down a big fleet of them and uh, basically do demo rides during the day where people could just take it out and go ride it around for twenty minutes, bring it back, and then we were going to do some uh, have some signups to do some longer rides and do some mm -hmm. of the famous trails around Moab where, you know, on. On an e-bike, you can actually roll sometimes two or three times the speed you can in your truck. So right. an hour and a half long Jeep trail makes for a really nice 45-minute bike trail. Right. Really? Or I should say e-bike trail. E-bike yeah, trail. Yeah, exactly. If you don't that, have the e-assist, it's still that, it's like longer than the <laughs> truck then, right? Yeah. Well, you, it's, it, it's probably about the same. It's just a whole lot more man, manual effort as you're, you know, you're having to be the motor to get up and over every bit of the hill. You come home a lot more tired. And in some cases, it's just not fun, right? It's just like, you know, this isn't fun anymore. You throw yeah. in the e-bike motor to it with the torque and the mm -hmm. tires that can handle the terrain. And now you're having a good time. See, like, right. a, you know, a lot of my mountain biking experience early on was around college age and in Kansas. And we have some fairly rocky hills and trails and stuff. It's It's nothing what it is out west but yeah at a certain point you're like i'm not having fun anymore every time i get to a point where i could flow down something i had a great time but like oh yeah just sitting there and pushing up all the time mm -hmm. sucks yeah you just it, you just over there. so yeah i'm definitely in there i definitely want to come back out now that i know pretty close to where you guys are like i'm gonna definitely swing by yep what are you barking at <laughs> The best part of that is my dogs have been going nuts most of the night and like Zeus is over here next to me he finally laid down luckily I have the headphones on otherwise he'd have been like who's barking he would have heard the barking <laughs> last I night my underway in here <laughs> sneaky little dog that's how my, my dad uh, my kids normally when they wander in I'm like how'd you get here what barking <laughs> no wandering in <laughs> <laughs> My dad, I, I'm on the phone with my dad last night, and he says to my brother's dog, he says, Macy, do you want to talk to Ross? And he, without even pause, just goes, wait a minute, you can't talk. And it just, like, <laughs> keeps going. I was like, what the fuck is going on? Your dad was having fun then. <laughs> oh, yeah, he was having fun. Got to have some fun nowadays. Oh, man. Sweet. So, yeah. Um, very, uh, very – so I, <laughs> I, I've spent a lot of time mountain biking, and – pretty much spent uh like all of middle school and most of high school mountain biking and then a lot of college mountain biking um sadly it has tapered off because life but and your back and also that which 
I'm, I am convinced happened in a, a snowboarding accident. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm extremely curious to eventually try out an e-bike and, you know, experience it after everybody's been talking about it now. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and the e-bike trend is only just going straight up, right? Oh, yeah. the, the biggest thing to take in mind and, and, you know, for people like us that want to go out and explore, um, not all e-bikes are created equal, right? Like I said, a, a lot that- of the e-bikes are still built on that European model with that 250 watt limit. Um, whereas our, our bikes and especially our new Jeep bike is a 750 watt a nominal watt motor with a 1500 watt peak. So oh, that means nuts. it's like overboost almost. Yeah. You guys, you know, you guys are talking about the, the new V8 and the new Wrangler and like, do you really need it? And you guys both know that after you drive it, you're going to be like, yeah, yeah, we totally need this. <laughs> <laughs> I need it every totally day. Need all oh, this yeah, need it Why did we not have all this power to begin with? <laughs> when am I getting the supercharger? <laughs> exactly. Right. right. And so that somebody that makes tunes for this. That, that was kind of our mentality as well on this was like, let's, let's give the thing the power that it needs to, to get up and go and do things. And that's where we're really separate from a lot of the other e-bikes you'll see. And you know, the, the electric mountain bikes that you'll see out there that look rather similar, they've got a motor, they've got a battery, they've got full suspension components and everything and, and full mountain bike build kits. Um, the big difference is going to be really coming down to that motor power. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the Jeep bike is going to give you 750 watts, um, you know, with that 1500 watt peak. So you can throw the saddlebags on there and load them up. You can put a backpack on, you can load the trailer full of gear, you know, and, and, and get out there and, and go further and, you know, really go exploring and bring whatever you want with you. Do they, they look like a lot of fun. <laughs> they really do. Dude, your guys' yeah. Instagram keeps me entertained. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, our, our bikes are cool because they, they feature the pedal assist, but they also have a thumb throttle on them. So okay. that, that classifies it as a class two electric bike. Mm-hmm. And if you're riding in a place where class one is the only thing that's allowed, you can simply unplug that throttle and you're class one compliant. Mm-hmm. Really? So it makes it really easy Smart. to be able to, yeah, you can use the throttle, but you can also remove it, you know, in places where it's required. Mm-hmm. Um, like it's ATV thumb really throttle, just push throttle? Yeah, just a push throttle, just kind of like you'd find on an ATV or a snowmobile. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. We run them on, we'll run them on the left hand uh, so that you've got your right thumb for all of your traditional mountain bike gears and, and all of that going on, just to free up the dashboard okay. a little bit. Um, Interesting. And like I said, it, it gives you the freedom to kind of use either one. Sometimes the pedal assist works really well, and other times, Maybe the terrain's a little gnarly and you don't want to be striking pedals. You want to keep the pedals nice and flat for clearance and just use the throttle to kind of get through a little awkward section. Or maybe you just want to kick back and you smart. Know, throttle on down the road. Very smart. I like what, that. What's the saying when you get stuck, when in doubt, throttle out? Yeah. <laughs> rip, rip it and rip it. Yeah. It's exactly. Usually. <laughs> Usually. <laughs> I'm I'm fully on board when when in doubt throttle out. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's it's been really cool with this, especially the new technology that we have in motors and batteries nowadays that we can you know create the the GP bike as you see it with a fully integrated battery, everything tucked inside, nice and protected, um, and then getting all of that power out of the motor. It's mounted in the middle, so that's called a mid-drive system as opposed to a a motor that would be mounted in a hub of a rear wheel or a front wheel. And that mid-drive system puts the power in the same place that your your body by pedaling puts the power, and then you get the full range of the gears in the rear. So you put it in the nice easy gear, climb up any hill that's out there, um, you know, put it down in the harder gear, you know, and you can reach Mm -hmm. that max speed. That's pretty cool. Man, if you had told me this shit existed when I was mountain biking in middle school, and I would have been like, "No, that's that's not real. It's so wild." <laughs> it's it's really cool the way that everything has evolved, and and honestly, the last the last ten years has been big, but really the last five years has been you know really crucial to making the electric bike the practical machine that we have here today. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I, seriously, I'm just it. scrolling through the Instagram page. I freaking love it. <laughs> I know, it's so cool. Especially with the video of the, the guy on the e -bike, GP bike with the gladiator chasing him on the trails. It's just, it looks hilarious. Right? It does. <laughs> Yeah, so that that is um, the the guy in there. That's a husband and wife. He runs our warehouse and is one of my colleagues in product development. And his wife, uh, she actually welds custom road bike frames. Okay, uh, cool. So they, they are like a true real life badass couple. Um, <laughs> Seriously, they, they that's a one two punch. Yeah, they were a perfect fit for that. They they look a little like. Uh... Yeah, I was going to say, like, 1980s action movie with, like, the scout <laughs> <up> front, <laughs> like, on the bike. Dude, you're not, you are not wrong. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, they are. They're, they're definitely both rock stars, and they, they <laughs> killed it. We, so we, I actually produced, uh, I wrote, directed, and produced that whole commercial there. Nice. And the original plan was to do the White Rim Trail. Okay. Um, oh, wow. COVID canceled that for us. Um, and then we had slid over a little bit and we were going to do some uh, public land trails um, outside of Moab up in kind of the Cane Creek area. Okay. Um, and then all the ground shut down, so we couldn't really stay out there. Um, so we ended up driving back into Colorado and filming all of that in Rabbit Valley. Um, exit two what? on I um, <laughs> So super, super cool spot uh, to get out and rip the Jeep and, you know, I, I got to do a big shout out to uh, the boys at Groove Auto um, for hooking it up with the, the brand new Jeep. Uh, they put the lift kit on it, put the tires on it, delivered it to me with seven miles. Wow. And I said, you realize I'm going to wow. take this romp it around in the desert, right? And they're like, yeah, we can't wait to see the pictures. <laughs> I mean, they got a good commercial out of it too. Fucking thing looks killer. Yeah, super super fun weekend. This this background that you see behind me, this is actually from the closing scene of that uh, that commercial. Okay, you know, watching the sunset and yeah, very you know, cool. the, whole, the whole concept was basically like, you know, let's go out and have a good time. Who gets to drive? Who mm -hmm. gets to ride? You know, hence the the rock paper scissors for who Switch. gets to go first. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, so that was that was a super super fun uh, super fun weekend. Um, and yeah, Megan and Wade, they uh, they killed it. Very cool. All right. Well, my computer smells like I have a candle burning and I, <laughs> I have no candles burning. So So that's this is how we decide to end the show. So yeah, yeah. let's real fast, I'm assuming Ryan Quiet Cat Social. Quiet Cat Off Road. Follow us on Instagram. We're on Facebook as well. So you guys have the Twitter. Are you using it? It's you know, I I I know we have the Twitter and I think we occasionally tweet, but really the best way to to follow us is gonna be Instagram. Yeah, in um, Instagram seems like it would be the, the best Instagram. for you guys. <laughs> yeah, that's a good yeah, follow. Our, it's a fun our, follow. Our, our creative director and uh, all of our ambassadors do a great job with you know delivering us some really cool content. So always a good variety of stuff on there. So you know, definitely check us out. Yeah, we'll have we to come have, out and visit you guys again. Seriously, I uh, just saying, <laughs> if you want a, uh, if you want somebody to test ride them, just you know, drop a line. Uh, absolutely, if you guys, if anytime you guys want to ride the bikes, we're happy to get you on them. We we want to get some bikes kind of spread out a little bit around the country. Um, Jeep dealerships are going to have them soon. Um, we're going wow. to get like, shipping cool. out uh, end of August. Mm -hmm. um, so check with your local Jeep dealership. Um, they have access to get the bikes. We're going to have a number of dealerships. They're going to have them on the floor um, really soon here. Um, the rest of the Quiet Cat line, of course, is available at quietcat.com. We're also in Bass Pro Shops, Shields, Sportsman's Guide. So a lot of places to check us out. A lot of cool specials going on right now. Uh, new products dropping soon. Mm -hmm. First Jeep bike coming next month. Um, cool. Really proud of that. Sweet. Awesome. That's great. I love this stuff. <laughs> Seriously. It's so That's why we cool. started a podcast so we could talk about this stuff. I know. Right? <laughs> Six no, you guys our this, interest. this is a great format too. You guys, you guys are a lot of fun. Well, it's nice. We realized since we're doing the video calls, we might as well post the video to YouTube as well. So it's, we're already doing the call. It's just 
more about me now having to edit and drop in pictures of what we talked about. <laughs> yeah, it's just more. It's just more work for you. That's all. It's right. more yeah. work for Chris. <laughs> the credit goes one hundred percent to Chris. So I, I, yeah. Somebody, somebody else had to do it with me. I couldn't do it by myself. So. Otherwise Fair and be, um, before we got guests, otherwise I would just be a single person talking to no one. So we had to have somebody to bounce them off first. Before well, we got. yes, touche, and also we may not have a show if my computer incinerates. So. Okay. On that note, I'm going to go because that's, this is not a good for smell episode. for any computer we're making. So, <laughs> Sphinx, thank you for joining us. Looking forward to talking again. All Absolutely. Right. Cheers, fellas. Let's catch up, uh, you know, once we can get out on the trails again. Yes, definitely. Sounds good. Unless that second stimulus check shows up, I might, we might just be headed out early. I'm signing off before I can talk about that. You guys are welcome anytime. I got plenty of campsites right outside the house. Sweet. Awesome.